the mythic weapon calls across the centuries in sacred groves deep in viridescent halls the blade beckons tis that before which each devil falls it is the master sword in hallowed whispers its name passes through time immemorial from father to son mother to daughter there are many iconic swords in works of fable but few of them are as enduring and ubiquitous as the sleeping sword of legend the blade of evil's bane the sword that seals the darkness as its name suggests the master sword is a weapon in search of a lord choosing the one who wields it an emblem of the status of hero it is the symbol of the chosen one in this story that hero that chosen one was a pink-haired elfin boy child of hyrule whose name we were required by memory to tell you was zelda this is triforce of the i mean a uh, link to the past the game in which the master sword made its debut before going on to become an integral part of the not at all overly confusing connection of timelines representing the Legend of Zelda series. Link, his true name, would ever choose the sword, and the sword would ever choose him. A fated romance playing out again and again across eternity. Our adventurous elf whelp found the legendary brand in the Lost Woods, embedded in a pedestal adorned with ancient Hylian hieroglyphs. The legend said, The hero's triumph on Cataclysm's Eve wins three symbols of virtue. The master sword he will then retrieve, keeping the knight's line true. The three pendants of virtue crystallized his right to take up the ancient weapon and vanquish evil before the sword is returned to its resting place in the woods at the end of the tale, awaiting the chance to choose the next hero. This wasn't just a hand-me-down wooden spatula from some old man in a cave. This was a holy sword imbued with iconography and symbolism. A divine blade of then mysterious origins until someone came along and expositioned it to death. More than just a piece of cold steel, part of what made the Master Sword powerful was what it represented. In choosing its heir, it justified the one that wielded it, granting its owner the authority, the right, the duty, and the office of destructor of evil and liberator of the land. In being so picky, the Master Sword's oath of purity guaranteed that it could never be brandished for vanity or arrogance or used by usurpers or taken up by tyrants. Ganon, step back! This is the Master Sword! The legendary sword that seals the darkness. Its blade gleams with a sacred luster that can oppose the calamity. Only a hero chosen by the sword itself may wield it. If that all sounds incredibly familiar, then you're beginning to get the gist of our shtick here at Gamelogica. I have little doubt that the Master Sword borrowed many elements of legend, inspired by myth to become the embodiment of the Legend of Zelda series. But there's one story with undeniable similarities. Circa the late 5th century, a young boy child of Britain drew a sword from an anvil. You know what? Forget the anvil. That's lame. He drew a sword from a stone. Now that has a ring to it. From that single act, he went on to become one of the most legendary kings and heroes in history. That boy was Arthur. Or Wart, if you're following along with the Disney version. Like Link, Arthur wielded the sword that no one else could wield. Whether the sword chose him, the miracle from heaven acknowledged him, or Merlin's magic confirmed his status. The sword was meant for him alone. Like so many protagonists in our modern digital myths, Arthur celebrated the idea of the humble king, pure of heart. The sword in the stone identified him as rightful heir to the crown, the son of Uther Pendragon. Whoso pulleth out this sword of this stone and anvil is rightwise king born of all England. Like Link, Arthur used the sword to battle back evil. 
In Arthur's day and for Arthur's people, evil represented the invading Saxons. Arthur drew his sword from the stone on Christmas, and that was probably when I got my copy of A Link to the Past. Like Link, Arthur possessed a broken sword. The Master Sword often needs powering up or awakening in the Legend of Zelda games. Take the most recent example, Tears of the Kingdom, in which an apocalyptic Hyrule finds a Link pulling a Shards of Narsal instead of a complete Master Sword. Likewise, King Arthur actually busted the sword in the stone during combat at one point. <laughs> Whoops. Like Link, Arthur wielded many swords. Depending on the version of the tale, did you know the sword in the stone isn't always the same thing as Excalibur? Excalibur Caliburnus is the name of another magical sword, the Sword of the Lake. The oldest surviving work containing the sword in the stone legend is Robert du Baron's French epic poem Merlin from the late 12th or early 13th century, and even that isn't in great shape. It dates to something like 600 years or so after Arthur was said to have lived, but I think we can go back even further than that. About a hundred years before the Sword in the Stone debuted in literature, there lived a man named Wolfstan, the Bishop of Worcester. He was the last of the pre-Norman conquest bishops. The highly hagiographical tale descends to us from Aelred of Rival's Vita Sancti Edwardi, and it goes that B. Wolfstan was a simple man. He apparently liked to sleep a lot, indicative of his holy indifference to matters of carnality. Note that Link is snoozing right along at the start of many Zelda games. Despite his penchant for some niloquy, Wolfstan managed to hold his position as bishop while his pre-conquest peers lost theirs to post-conquest replacements. He was so mundane, in fact, that the newly appointed Archbishop of Canterbury, a post-conquest man of the cloth, didn't like the cut of his jib and wanted him kicked out of office. The Archbishop called for Wolfstan to surrender his episcopal staff, the symbol of his bishopship. Refusing to accept the Archbishop's authority, Wolfstan the man takes his staff and down airs it into the stone tomb of King Edward the Confessor, crying, Receive it, my lord, and deliver it unto whomever you please. None of the other clergymen, not even the Archbishop himself, could remove Wolfstan's staff from the stone. As ashamed as any 11th century cleric could be, the Archbishop invites Wolfstan to take up his staff once more. Wolfstan, however, insists that as only King Edward could remove him from his position, only Edward can reinstate him. Wolfstan returns to the tomb and calls out to the spirit of the king for a decision on the fate of his office, and he reaches for his staff, only to find it leaping into his hand. It is this miracle attributed to the last pre-conquest bishop that many scholars point to as the source for the story of Arthur's sword in the stone, and thus too for the master sword itself. Now whether Arthur's sword in the stone or Wolfstan's staff in the tomb were ever real or not is indeed a curiosity, but clearly beside the point. We'd all like to believe that our leaders, whether they be political or religious, are chosen in some form or another, be that democratically or by the will of God or gods or the universe. It's a powerful wish to imagine a fated hero who had put his own life on the line for his people and their beliefs, confirmed by heaven with a heart so pure that can only be verified by the acceptance of a miraculous sword or staff. While the world awaits such a hero, at least we have the legends of Zelda, Arthur, and Wolfstan to keep us warm. Oh, and let's add Theseus to the pile, who had a sword under a stone, but that is a story for another day. If you learned something, hit the like button and subscribe so you won't miss any future episodes. If you want to see more micro-documentaries like this one, please consider making a small monthly donation at patreon.com forward slash gamelogica. If you have an idea for a topic we should explore along the crossroads of video games, religion, spirituality, and mythology, let us know in the comments. Fidem Fabula Ludos. See you next time.